Pleased to have you here with us today for our 98th episode of This is CDR. This is CDR is an online event series presented by OpenAir to uh, explore the range of CDR solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals. OpenAir seeks to advance at every level of government here in the U.S., as well as in national and subnational jurisdictions globally. My name is Toby Bryce. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work on policy and market development with OpenAir. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself in the chat with your affiliation, if you'd like, and tell us where you're Zooming in from. Um, and please direct that message to everyone, not just hosts and panelists. Um, just might need to change that setting in the Zoom chat. Quick background on open air. If you're not familiar with us, we're a distributed all volunteer network dedicated to the responsible advancement of CDR. Um, we are a global community. We work together on shared projects that we call missions that are open source endeavors in the areas of policy, innovation, communications, and market development. Here's a um, uh, sort of a graphic from our website to illustrate the kinds of projects we work on in those four areas. We have a few dozen live projects. Um, if you join us, there's an opportunity to start your own projects, join existing projects. Like I said, we're open source and we're all working together really to advance CDR on those various fronts. My colleague, Mega Raghavan, who you'll meet in a second, is running the chat and she'll be putting some links, background links. There's a link to a forum that you can fill out to sign up for our group and join our Discord server, which is like Slack and how we organize our projects. And we'd love to have you be a part of what we're doing. Two policy projects that are kind of a uh, hot hot button issues for us right now. We have state level CDR bills in, in Massachusetts and in California. The Massachusetts bill is called S2096. It's a state level CDR procurement policy, um, similar in nature to the uh, DOE federal CDR procurement initiatives and um, very impactful as we can scale these um, as, as we can scale these policies across jurisdictions to provide demand support for CDR, which as we'll, we all know we need. Um, and a very ambitious bill also in California, SB 308, is different. It sets up a negative emissions compliance market starting in 2029 to sit alongside the existing um, California emissions trading scheme. Um, first of its kind policy really for a, for a compliance market for CDR, super ambitious, um, sponsored by Josh Becker, uh, the state senator from uh, Silicon Valley area. It's passed the Senate in California and we're now working to get it advanced in the um, state assembly in California. So both of these policies are super impactful, really important. And if you live in California or Massachusetts, we can really use help from you to, um, to uh, contact your local representatives and ask them to support the policy. It's super impactful to get constituents to reach out to support these things and we could really use your help. As always, just quick definition of terms. Um, this audience is familiar with it at this point, but uh, CDR, this is a definition from the CDR Primer, which is a great resource to learn about CDR. We'll put a link to that in the chat. It's essentially the same definition that the IPCC uses as well, and we think it's a good one to work with. Um, purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. It's important to disambiguate CDR, removing CO2 from the atmosphere, um, from uh, CCS, which typically refers to removing um, CO2 from a fossil carbon emission source. Um, that's often conflated in the media. It's important that CDR is like drawing down the ledger, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. The other really important thing that we have to emphasize before every episode and whenever we talk about CDR is that CDR is in no way, shape or form any sort of substitute for rapid reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. We need to decarbonize the global economy, reduce greenhouse gas emissions as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. CDR cannot get in the way of that. It's not an excuse not to do that. Um, it, uh, so we need to be working on both. That said, there's clear scientific consensus that CDR will be needed at massive scale, billions of tons per year by mid-century, in order to neutralize what we call residual emissions, um, the uh, emissions that we can't um, eliminate in a climate-relevant time frame. There's a lot of great work on that. We had Holly Buck on the show a few months ago to talk about this issue. Um, but CDR will be needed at billion ton scale for that by mid-century to reach net zero. And then in the second half of the century, we're going to need CDR to start removing legacy emissions. That is the trillion plus, probably two trillion plus tons of CO2 that will be in the atmosphere in the 2050 to 2100 range so that we can restore our climate to a safer and healthier state. So CDR is an essential climate solution. It's a complement to reducing emissions and not a substitute. We need to work on both. Um, 
CDR needs to be scaled from its current kiloton scale, tens of kilotons per year, to billions of tons a year. So that's a lot of work, several orders of magnitude a leap, and that's what we're here to discuss. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mega, and who is going to introduce herself and talk about run of show and introduce today's speaker. Hi, everyone. I'm Mega. I'm an open air member uh, based in London, and I work on policy and market development as well. Um, so as usual, before we begin, our format is going to be a short presentation, followed by a few prepared questions and then moderated audience Q&A. So please do type any questions you have uh, into Zoom's Q&A box as we go along. It's separate from the chat box. Please make sure you find the right one so that we can organize the questions better. Um, the event is being recorded as well, so we'll send the video out to all of you who registered, as well as post it to uh, Open Air's website and Open Air's YouTube channel as well. Um, okay, this week we're very pleased to welcome Dr. David Hughes of Penn State University to present his work with Plant Village and to discuss how we can advance biochar carbon removal to gigaton scale. Uh, Dr. Hughes is the Dorothy Four Huck and J. Lloyd Huck Chair in Global Food Security at Penn State University and the Director of the USAID Innovation Lab on Current and Emerging Threats to Crops. He's additionally the founder of Plant Village, which is a for-profit um, enterprise, as well as the for-profit enterprises Carbon for Good and Plant Village Plus and the Village Youth Fund. Plant Village is a public good research enterprise at Penn State that leverages AI to help smallholder farmers adapt to climate change and leverage their farms to mitigate climate change via AI. It's one of the 15 teams to have won an x Prize Carbon Removal Milestone Award and is now competing for the grand prize. Plant Village has developed a digital monitoring, reporting, and verification, or MRV system, which is available to co-development partners, including Biochar Life, Carboneers, and others via Plant Village Plus and the company's Biochar app. Um, so, David, whenever you're ready, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Mega, for, for the introduction, for the invitation, and also thank you, Toby, uh, for the introduction and the invitation. So it's really a great pleasure to be able to come and share with the community uh, the work that we're doing here in, in um, Plant Village Plus. And exactly as Mega said, it is indeed uh, a private spin out from Penn State University. So I just want to give some background to where we are in what we're doing for Plant Village and, and how we got to be where we are today. So Plant Village is a software solution leveraging AI for people in the global south to adapt to climate change and also to uh, deal with pests and diseases on their farms. And it comes out of Penn State University and Penn State is a land grant university which has been doing this in the United States since 1862. So the idea is to help smallholder farmers like Rosalind here in the foreground deal with pests and diseases. And the reason we would want to do that is because they impose a tremendous tax on production for people like her and her neighbor, Emiliana, in the background. So the idea is to be leverage AI to be a land-grant university in, a, in billions of phones to help people in the global south. Why would we want to do that? Well, well, this is Ireland, my country, in 1847, and this is Africa today. The needle has not moved despite the, the power of smartphones, despite, despite the cloud, despite Zoom, despite all the things that we're using on a daily basis, people in Africa are still... Uh, operating as if it was 170 years ago, or even 2,800 years ago. Uh, this is the a friend of Plant Village, the former U.S. ambassador to the Rome-based agency, Kip Tom, showing uh, a museum exhibit he saw in Zimbabwe and farmers in Zimbabwe, in that case 2019, using primitive tools. So this is, of course, uh, just completely unjust and wrong. And, and the idea of leveraging AI is to change that landscape. And we need to change that landscape because the biggest threat facing those farmers is climate change. Uh, as Mega said, we are the current and emerging threats to crops innovation lab. So we think about things like locusts or caterpillars or viral diseases. But now it's climate change everywhere, uh, uh, always and al always uh, being that massive threat that we have to kind of keep front and center in our attention. Here's an example of climate change in Africa. Uh, these are uh, corn or maize plants, and you, you kind of think they may be onions. Um, and it's because of the massive loss of uh, moisture from the field due to large amounts of heat, as well as increasing wind. This is increasing conditions from climate change. And so our idea, and this is the one that we won the uh, Carbon X Prize, the two parts of it, we're only one of two teams who won two parts of the X Prize. We won the, the student and then the milestone. And we've also had investments from Cisco in this as well as Google, is to scale up AI-powered carbon capture cubes across the global south, across the equator, uh, because that's necessary to protect those farms from the 
loss of moisture from the field. So it's climate change adaptation. Turns out that's also climate change mitigation, of course. So we want to have a border row of trees on the farms to increase productivity and to move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, from these onions to highly productive fields. And that's really important because we know, this is Burkina Faso, we know from a lot of work that the benefit of trees in terms of shading and keep moisture in the field is, is huge. You can see this from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, just the, the gross differences in temperature and humidity in the system. So here's uh, some of the trees we planted in Kenya, uh, where we'd have the double row of trees along the farm border to increase the protection. And here's the benefits. These trees are only four and a half years old. So it's a tropic. So things grow fast and, and luxuriantly. And the idea is then we can, we can, we've done this across about 13,500 farms, uh, which we call carbon capture cubes in the last 18 months in Kenya and Burkina Faso. But the idea is to kind of scale this up across the multiple locations we work. And the benefit, of course, is, is not just climate change adaptation by reducing the loss of moisture from the field. It's also carbon capture at, at scale. So the waste biomass from the trees or the waste biomass from the crops, which is produced, is then converted into biochar and then sunk into the soil. So the cube offers the potential to capture and store carbon, but also uh, have it in the soil for the beneficial uh, outcomes that 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 we all know about. So one of those beneficial outcomes is a delivery mechanism for microbes, for example, mycorrhizal fungi or or fusarium, which is very necessary for controlling weeds in the system. So we can put in biochar and then we can also deliver beneficial microbes. Of course, the huge benefit of biochar is the water holding capacity increase. So it's basically a sponge. I mean, the plants have evolved to move water around their systems. So that's what we're benefiting from. And here's a dramatic example of this from 2022, which was the worst drought in 72 years in Kenya. So on the left, we have business as usual. On the right, we have biochar with these impressions called zypits. And you and these are fields planted on the same day, side by side. So a massive, massive impact of biochar. Uh, we also take the model of turning trash into treasure. So this is also Kenya, where we have this uh, massively invasive weed called prosopsis on the left. And we turn that into fields of, in this case, fodder grass that the local community can use. And then we work very closely with the local community to remove this weed, uh, generate income from, from carbon credits for the community, but also kind of rehabilitate the, the landscape. And then follow this over time. So these are some uh, planet.com uh, data that Derek Moore and our team has, has just kind of retrieved for us. And so we can see how we're removing the invasive weed and then we're planting the grasses and then measuring that carbon across time to understand what is the, the long-term effect? Because if we're going to go in and do this intervention that we're all talking about, which is essentially uh, the, the carboniferous period once more, because we put gigatons of carbon into the soil, we're going to necessarily want to understand what is the effect of that over time. So that's an important component of why we work from the framework of a university with open access policies and understanding of the development of the scientific approach, which is so crucial for our collective success. In addition, we want to make sure we're working with communities. So here's a community in northern Kenya, which is a dry land. They went through massive droughts and we turn those dry lands into highly productive uh, systems. So, so Air, Air Approach is saying that if you can grow, have a golf course in Phoenix, Arizona, you can grow food in the desert in northern Kenya and you should. And especially for communities like, like these, so this is Debeila Deb Roya on the left-hand side. Uh, she's a mother of seven. Uh, and now she's, you know, grown up as a pastoralist. She's part of the uh, um, Rendil tribe in Marsabit. And we work with multiple tribes. And she's now moving from a very subsistence living into being a businesswoman. So she's growing these vegetables, she's selling them to her local communities, and then really having this large scale behavioral change, which is so important. Here's another example of this. This is a, an irrigation system we put in. So we have irrigation coming in, but biochar is in there holding the water. So we can make the water we have go further and have greater, greater impact. So, Partially, what we also do is leverage lots of data from NASA, NOAA, and, and other sources to build up this understanding of, of where we're going to need more biochar. What is the benefit of that biochar? So when people are using our system for recording 
the carbon dioxide removal, which is one component of it, we want to make sure that the global community of scientists are able to look at that data and understand its positive or negative effects. So in the same way, you only take a COVID vaccine because you understand somewhere there's a scientist looking at that and looking at the genetic data, which is called GenBank. We would advocate that you need a carbon bank. We need to have all of our collected data and the algorithms uh, uh, observable by, by scientists who don't have any commercial interest in saying one thing or the other. So that's a check and balance we think that's really important in the system. So that brings us on to the, the DMRV system. So how do we take our village mentality and scale biochar uh, drawdown, carbon dioxide drawdown and biochar production via nice companies like Biochar Life and Carboneers that, that Mega mentioned earlier. And so the first principle I think to emphasize here, it's hard to build a better mousetrap than photosynthesis for carbon, carbon dioxide capture. So if you can have this, then you get to remove that to produce fiber, fuel, and food for an enormous market, but only if you can protect it. So this is where the AI component of Plant Village comes in, where we can use the benefit of diagnosing the problem and also selling farmers inputs that prevent the diseases and pests, taking away the farmer's profits before we get a chance to do so. Uh, and the more farmers grow, the more we have waste biomass, which can be converted into biochar. So none of us here on this call will be surprised to understand this is a, a massive market. And so what we propose is to use AI enhanced sales force to 10x CO2 capture from farms across the equator, and then enable companies like Biochar Life to work with us in order to use the best in class software. So we can have those checks and balances in the system, and we can all understand the effectiveness of what we're trying to do. So AI, we believe, allows a farm to be a fallow asset. And we're all very familiar with this. We have an unused car that becomes Uber. We have an unused room in your house that becomes Airbnb. A farm in the global south plus an AI-powered smartphone can become a carbon capture cube from Plant Village, from Carboneers, from Biochar Life, and lots of other companies in, 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 in as well. And it can be the largest carbon removal factory in the world. I think that's an important point but only if we embrace modularity. So we need to have modular units, for example, the Contiki Kilns. This is a, a batch system that we've developed for our XPRIZE, moving towards where the harvest is. So if we know what people are growing, we know when the harvest is gonna happen, we can send in the system in order to benefit from that waste biomass. The other part is also a technology ladder. So this is work we're doing with DSS Plus and led by Dries Rubenbrecht, who's on our team. In this case, we take in waste biomass, but we also produce heat and electricity as an output. And you can use that heat to increase the market capacity for the farmers who, in this case, are growing cassava uh, so they can sell to the international markets. So having renewable energy from fields across the tropics is a very good in idea in and of itself, but it's also a great way to make biochar. And the component that we're trying to add here is having a fleet of electric tuk-tuks. So we have solar panels, which are going to be providing free electricity, but also no carbon electricity for a fleet that can bring in those kilns, uh, take, bring in the inputs, take away the waste biomass, bring back the biochar fertilizer, and the whole thing can be driving uh, economic mobility, but also mobility across uh, multiple regions in Africa because people need vehicles. So as we said, we're, we're really fond of, of other companies like Carboneers and Biochar Life, but also Mava, and, and really bringing lots of people into our ecosystem so that we can collectively work on this together. And I think that's important because this model is wrong. Um, and, and it's not just wrong because we're promoting carbon dioxide removal. Um, it, it's, it's wrong based upon a study by a Danish economist of over 16,000 large projects around the world, whether it's a, a computer software site or a bridge. Large projects go over budget over time and underperformance. Um, and, and, we, and plus the, the energy requirements of this construction, uh, we don't understand where the which we're going to trade off against renewable energy sources. And also just on moral grounds, if you can have biochar, which is working today, helping smallholder farmers and giving them income as, as biochar life have demonstrated quite, quite well, but also helping the soil. So why are we pushing for this high tech future solution that may or may not pay out? Uh, so there's a lot of reasons why we should be betting on 
local local modularized production of biochar across the global south. It doesn't have winter. That's one great reason. So I want to just kind of show the platform. I hope that if I switch here, you can see that and, and make a shout out if I if you can't. So this is our platform here, and, and we use it for a lot of different things, uh, such as the USAID Innovation Lab, such as the, the United Nations are using it for a variety of different uh, crops and diseases and problems. But let's just go into its use for, for biochar. So here we have multiple companies, uh, Varhard Capital, Carbon for Good, um, also uh, biochar life is somewhere down here so here we have we can just kind of zoom into one of the activities so in this case we have an observer so that might be as part of the ceasing mechanism and then we have a farm name and everything on the system is captured and recorded so in this case what is the biomass all the kilns have an individual record so we can see the conditions that are happening are we have too much smoke is the is the timeline correct and then we have the eventual production that is coming from this. So in this case, the kiln has finished in the right time. We've got five bags of biochar. Every, everything is timestamped and geo-coordinates geo -coordinate, geo are recorded. And then we have the five bags here. So we can also uh, reduce the incidence of fraud or cheating in the system by having this tracking. Now, there are very strict rules about who can modify this and everything is open. So biochar life could see this or carboneers could see this. And we have checks and balances in the system, which is really, really important. Uh, some groups like biochar life have, have put a lot of work in. This is our common platform where, where CSI and, and Ithaca Institute are involved. And they put in a huge amount of work uh, helping us improve it. So, so basically improving through uh, lots of feedback. So we really see the companies that we work with as co-developers of this software and helping us. So they have uh, multiple details to put in. And I think this is how we, we collectively succeed by all of us building the platform together and building the utility of that. So this is production. So the other part of it is mixing because you want to be mixing your biochar with uh, fertilizer. So in this case, it's from Nepal. Uh, and, and you have the biochar mixing survey. You've got a fertilizer, whether you use it or manure. And everything is linked. So from this case, the production here is linked to the usage survey. And if we go over to this part here, which is uh, the final utility of this, this is also uh, something that is tracked throughout the entire process. So in this case, we can see whether a payment was made and whether we have photos of the process. In this case, we're putting it into the soil and we have um, multiple examples of, of this being used. So we can kind of look at this one here. And so everything is, is trackable and traceable. So in this case, we're putting the biochar into the soil for the farmer, in this case, growing maize. So you can track the production system throughout. And then you can also, um, I think I had a nice one from Dorcas I wanted to show. Yeah. So this is a really cool one. This is just from today. I, I, we're not kind of lining these up on purpose. But here we're working with climate change clubs, which are local, local schools, and they're planting trees with biochar underneath. So you can be offsetting your carbon as a company like Microsoft, but you also are, are, are massively impacting communities because we're going to be tracking these trees across the next 20 years. And how well are they shading that school? How well are they helping that school? How well are they educating these kids on climate change and, and, and having these kids be massively important ambassadors in a new world whereby they have to educate their parents on climate change and help their communities adapt? So eventually you want to sell these carbon credits. So this can go into this part here. And this is then uh, developed. We have multiple checks here that goes off to Carbon Standards International or Carbon Future. So we have an API. And eventually when a customer is buying this, they get to see all the data. So all the data is available. But in addition, the data is going to be sitting on a public repository so that we can continue the development of it. As mentioned, we are an AI organization. So we want to be using uh, these images coming true, in this case of a, a Kontiki kiln in India, to develop these AI systems, which are going to be open and transparent, uh, built by and for the people, so we can understand whether and to what extent AI is, is helping us. Because if we are going to get to a gigaton, we need to make sure that AI is 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 well built and robust because humans simply can't do it. The, the verification system in CDR is broken, uh, slow and uh, expensive. So obviously software is a great thing at, at fixing broken, slow and expensive systems. So one other part of the software is the ability to look at the systems over time. This is all of our 
all of our groups have this, the customers, uh, they can see uh, surveys, they can they can see maps, and they can check to see uh, which parts are, are, are to be done. They can drill down into their own work. And you as a company, if you're using this, you can see what other companies are doing. We think that that is really important because that increases the uh, trust in the system and it increases the ability for people to, to use it and appreciate it. And, and basically build it together. So our philosophy is, is quite simple. Uh, as a village coming out of a university, we believe in collective construction. We believe in open, transparent systems. And if that's what you're interested in, so please reach out to us and collectively we can we can help solve what is the biggest problem facing humanity. So with that, I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll thank you for your time and we can have questions. Awesome. Thank you, David. That was really that was really impressive. Um, appreciate you uh, sharing all that with us. Um, maybe just to kick off, uh, you know, I hadn't realized this before doing a little prep for the program today. But you you're you uh, are an entomologist by trade initially, at least. And um, can you talk a little bit about how the that I guess coming from that discipline, um, that field, got you to biochar? Like, what was the when did you make that connection? And then when did you start thinking about the sort of CDR opportunity associated with some of this work? Yeah, so I grew up with an intense interest in entomology and, and insects and social insects. Um, I've always wanted to study those um, since I you know, grew up watching David Attenborough on TV. Uh, I then was kicked out of school at the age of 15 and, and didn't have an education, but got back into it. And then I just had a whole career studying ants in rainforests. If you watch The Last of Us, that's all based upon my research on zombie ants. Um, and eventually David Attenborough was narrating a TV program on Netflix based upon a species of fungus that I named that controls ant behavior. I named it after my wife. It's from the Amazon. And so I'd come full circle. I, I was having a wonderful career studying ants in rainforests. The problem is that you come out of the rainforest and you see the conditions that I showed on that slide of African farmers who just don't have access. And so I feel studying insects or doing ecology or evolutionary biology as I was doing is a little bit like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, that's why I moved into food security and now into climate change uh, exclusively. So what kind of help does that give me uh, in the system? I guess I come as a, from an outsider, just on first principles, trying to you know grow food. That's why the photosynthesis equation is there as a rainforest ecologist. Um, and I guess it also gives me a strong advantage in that I am very technical. I've described 29 new species. I'm sure eight of them are already extinct. Um, but being very technical and, and very much um, orientated around documenting life on Earth, that really gives me the ability to demand that every gram of carbon that we're going to capture is documented uh, with, with evidence, because that's critically important for the trust. And when did you make that the, the biochar connection? When did biochar, when did you start thinking about it? When did you start integrating biochar into this work and the sort of increase the food security work? Yeah, it was a, it was um, the 23rd of March, 2019. Um, so that was when the first cyclone hit uh, Mozambique and it was the largest cyclone ever to hit East Africa. And then it was followed, I think on the 21st, the 24th of April, 2019. Uh, by the second one, uh, so Idea and, and uh, Matthew. And that was, the second one was the largest one. And so because of climate change, there, there's just increasing cyclones moving in across East Africa. And, and that's the future. And farmers that we worked with at the time in East Africa had three failed attempts at planting their crops. They, they were putting in the, in the maize seeds, it wasn't working. And then it became extraordinarily obvious to me that we need to have micro-irrigation in the soil. And biochar is micro-irrigation. It holds water because it is plant cells. And when I was born in 1974, the rate of irrigation in Africa was 5%. Now, at the age of 50, it is it is 6%. And so the, move, the needle is not moving. So we need to leverage the power of biochar to massively scale up micro-irrigation, as well as increasing the quality of the soil. So that was when I really... Uh, thought about it. And then I was just pushing the entire team on Plant Village to embrace it. And, and uh, you know, really everybody's gotten on board. And now biochar is having a moment. Um, it's not just the water holding capacity. It was obviously necessary because of the old soil. So the soils in Ireland are about 12,000 years old because of the Ice Age. Soils in Africa are older than the dinosaurs. 
Uh, so they're they're leached, they're poor, they're 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 very low nutrients, and biochar massively increases that. So we're approaching biochar from improving the livelihoods of farmers, uh, just on first principles of growing food, and that's the answer to that question. Got it. Um, <clears throat> your in terms of the the I don't know if there is the, you showed a couple of different form factors for pyrolyzers, the Contiki kilns, and then the one that you developed for XPRIZE, and then there was one that also generates heat and electricity. Um, how does, when you're just from a generating carbon credits, how do you, how do you ensure the consistency of the biochar product when you're using different systems? Like, is there a common temperature? Is there any sort of process commonality or, or is the, is the output somewhat heterogeneous based on what the, the, thermal conversion processes. Yeah, I think it's heterogeneous. And I think uh, even industrial processes, we we know that from a lot of people have been reaching out to me but based upon the LinkedIn post I did on, on, on transparency and fraud. And um, so even industrial machines, which we were getting and setting up in North America, have heterogeneity in, in the mix. So I think I think the only way we get around that is being extremely transparent with the data. So so that means throughout the, for example, if it's if it's a if it's a fire pit method in the ground or contiki, you're measuring temperature throughout. So so this is the real nice advantage of working with carbon ears and biochar life. We're all collectively designing that. So that's one way. And uh, the other way is to is to really keep people like Hans Peter Schmidt and others involved in, in, in this so we can have the scientific evidence uh, presented and, and, and understood. And then as we get to the industrial systems, make sure that we're developing them with the MRV front and center. And 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 that's not transparent. Like, you know, I reached out to Puro to talk to them about their the MRV and, and their first response was, well, let's sign an NDA. And that's not the way forward. That's we, you know, we can't we can't have a world like this. We need to make sure that all of these things are examinable. Again, would you put a COVID vaccine in your arm if if you understood it was developed by Google and nobody could see the algorithm? No, you wouldn't. You only do it because you know that somewhere there is a bunch of scientists examining this data uh, quite intently uh, for, and from the public perspective. And how? So it, I guess that segues into the next question and and how how do you just with a distributed approach with with s relatively small numerous numerous small nodes of production how do you ensure the quality control and prevent fraud and and I, you know you showed some images but like what are the specific like what does the system do to so there's transparency but you pointed out that at scale no human can actually look at all this stuff so how like a you know ai like what what specifically does ai do um in the in the system to address these challenges so the the computer software just by itself is enabling us to understand is the timeline sensible so let's say we do 10,000 runs and we find that this 5% is, you know, uh, two hours longer than everything else. So that that is a trigger. And, and so the idea that wow. software acts as a co-pilot to the human to come in and force the human to look at these anomalous cases, which may have an, an obvious explanation or, or, or may not. So that's one way in which software just can pick it up that, that, that we can do today. AI is going to be a co-pilot, uh, so enabling humans to look at certain cases, and then over time, the jobs which the humans have to do will be more specific and more detailed, so AI can can understand the, the 80% or 90% of those, but only if all of the AI is open, only if there are hundreds of scientists out there who have no skin in the game, who are just doing their research projects and want to look into it. So that's the critical point of making the algorithms open and, and making it the, the training data open and the whole pathway so that other scientists can come in and see this and they're not part of the company and they're not financially incentivized. So remember the Theranos company where you know a prick of blood would allow you to diagnose all your problems. If diagnostic services are privatized, then there's an, there's an incentive structure in the system to overstate the competency. Of course there is. So, so by, um, and this is not the first time we've had this issue. I've, I've meant, mentioned genetic data a number of times. That works really, really well. Also, when you go and buy a steak in, in, in a supermarket, it's from multiple small farms, but because we have a public system of a stamp from USDA here in the United States, it gives you the security because there are people observing this. So this is a solved problem in multiple industries.
Um, so I'm going to ask about a couple of, and these are not intended to be provocative or gotcha questions, but just to get your views on these issues that are um, often discussed with respect to biochar. Um, so number one, durability. Um, I think a, a biochar obviously has many supporters, but um, I think there have been some, I won't say critics, but but um, folks who feel like maybe biochar has some challenges from a CDR perspective uh, with durability. Um, I'm sure everyone's a aware of the recently published research from the scientist in, I believe, Denmark, who is asserting that certain industrial processes at high temperature can lead, can generate what's called uh, inert night. And I'll put a, a link in the chat that, that sort of assures permanence on a geologic time scale. Um, it seems like the process that you're using where you're putting the, the biochar in the soil as a soil amendment is not going to have that same level of permanence. So how do you think about durability? Um, in general, I mean, obviously your process has a lot of co-benefits, but from a carbon removal perspective. Yeah, so your your question is, is, is not understanding the scientific process. The scientist who published the paper is not asserting it. What the scientist is doing is putting the paper into the public domain as peer reviewed literature so we can do we can do updating of this so it's not an opinion um the opinions come from the people who are financially incentivized not to have biochar work so when i was on the stage at the x prize event in san francisco one of the the ceos of direct air capture was there proposing that they've got the best thing since sliced bread and and of course they're going to say that because they've had hundreds of millions of venture capital funds invested in this, and they say, oh, we must have a thousand year durability, which which inertinite does. Um, but I would say, you know, a thousand years, the Vikings were in Dublin. I mean, a lot changes in a thousand years. If we just get a hundred years, it's sufficient. But but the reason the reason there's such anti biochar sentiment is that it doesn't it doesn't benefit the large investment organizations who who are putting you know what is it 60 million dollars into one company or whatever's the case so that future investors get a benefit so it's this it's this love of techno optimism and it's the love of investment structures exactly the same thing that got us into the current mess and so biochar is not appreciated, um, not on scientific. I mean, every single, uh, Jan Rashnoff at, at Frontiers, everybody I've challenged on this to give me a clear answer as to why it's not beneficial doesn't answer the question. Um, be, because, because scientifically, it has the durability. Because even if it just gets 100 years, then, then that's what we need. We need to get through the next 100 years. And if it's delivering 94% of CDR credits in 2023, then it's an incredibly beneficial tool you can use today. It's just that it benefits a smallholder farmer at the expense of the investor. I would say that I, I don't, I've not literally never heard anyone say that biochar offers no benefits, um, number one. Um, and number two, uh, you know, I think that I, your points are well taken, um, uh, but you know, I think that that the 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 questions about biochar have been with durability, and I think there's some research that's 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 addressing that question, and then with carbon efficiency, which is a separate question. Like you're not, you know, if we have a limited, scarce pool of residual biomass resource, is biochar the best way to get carbon removal out of that? But um, you know, I think you your process offers a lot of co-benefits beyond carbon removal that I think one could point to. And it, so, you know, for example, a, a European biochar company yesterday announced a $27 million funding raise. So the biochar sector is not exactly without capital completely. And there is this sort of like bifurcation in the market between the more industrial biochar approaches that are sort of off, you know, they're, they're, they're saying that they have uh, consistent, consistent pro production and you know, greater permanence because they're using a high, like a uniform high temperature process. And then you have the more distributed approach for that you guys are working on. How would you, do you think there is a bifurcation in the market? And if so, what are, is it a problem or can we just think of these two different types of credits? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's a technology ladder. So if you're thinking about people in the global South, uh, the kind of really excellent work that, that Biochar Life is doing is capturing and storing carbon. And, and it is then driving the uptake of this. So that is that is beneficial in and of itself. Um, then, of course, you can layer on top of that a Contiki kill, and then you can layer on top of that renewable energy. So, so the 
the jury's not out on on durability. It's just it, it it's it's always introduced by people and like oh there could be these issues etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the 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 evidence even from the initial seventy five to twenty five percent split on the the aromatic compound uh, ratios shows that you have durability at l even just over 100 years so even just accepting that uh, it was already a good tool and i think there, there's just a greater issue i find i find a lot of people raising these questions damn with faint praise um but it is it is the the carbon dioxide removal technology that is currently the most scalable today and we should have been doing this 15 years ago and so arguing about these sorts of things doesn't help our collective problem um and then i think the the broader question is well financially why would people be against biochar and then you get into super interesting questions well because we want to have you know larger high production systems um which which are not going to have the greatest collective benefit you know the the, the tropics is a really interesting place to grow plants and it's not a com competition with with food production because food production is extremely low across the tropics. So 70% of cassava, for example, is not consumed. So that can feed the, the bio, biochar production systems. Um, yep. Yeah, no, I, I definitely hear your points. And I, I don't think that, uh, well, when you, when you say that you feel like there's so many, uh, um, I mean, biochar, as you point out, is the bulk of the current sold CDR market. So biochar has plenty of supporters. There are, are I think there's one prominent buyer who does not support it. But, um, you know, what what do you feel like, where do you feel like the criticisms, what do you feel like the primary criticisms are that you hear that you are reacting to? The reason biochar is 94% is not because it has supporters, it's because the other CDR systems are not de not delivering. and uh, They've over-promised and under-delivered. And, and and so then if you look comparatively at the amount of investment that went into tail mining heirloom or or oil in the ground charm or or uh, direct air capture look at the comparative investment if we had have used that investment to 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 massively upscale modular systems how much further down the path would we have been so it's not a vote of confidence it's an act of desperation that microsoft come out and say we need you know, so much uh, biochar now because they're not fulfilling their quota. And so I think the 2024 is really showing us that actually it can be the best of both worlds. It can be a durable form of carbon dioxide removal that has the benefits that, that, are, that are important for adoption. Because as soon as you start building these large factories, you get into so many issues, like, like the movement of the direct air capture into the United States because of the Investment Reduction Act somebody somewhere is going to hold up the production of these mega factories because not in my backyard you know just we just know this we know that large large systems and this is not us saying this or me saying this because i i favor biochar this is a collective action problem you know we we need to pull down uh, so much and, and we know from the estimates we're on such a slow sl or a limited slope at the moment so we need to kind of up our game yeah um, I'm very much enjoying this conversation and would love to continue it, but we have some really good audience questions coming in and I uh, want to switch over to Mega to um, to ask some of those, but thank you, David. Sure, yeah. So I think the first one I wanted to ask was just about the different technologies and Toby touched on a little bit, but um, there's kind of, you know, there's more traditional means of production and then now there's systems that are looking at doing heat or power cogeneration. So is that something that you see you know, also potentially being applicable in the global south and in these kind of community-based organizations, or yeah, how do you see that shaping up? Yeah, absolutely, because people need industrial heat in order to increase the value of their crops. So, so there's an unmet need there because, in the case of cassava, for example, that they could export and make lots of money from, it's used in lots of things. So, in that case, they cannot because it starts off at forty percent moisture and needs to be six percent, and that might take them eight or nine or 12 days to do that with sun drying. And, and the problem there is the E. coli comes in, the bacteria, and then they can't sell it. But if you can do that in, in nine hours, because you have heat coming from your biochar system, then all of a sudden you can export your cassava to the Netherlands and make you know five times more than you would have made before. In addition, of course, uh, the systems offer renewable electricity. So you can have solar power and, and, and I think 94% of Kenya's electricity is from solar. But, you know, what about nighttime? 
so you can have renewable, you can have a 24 hour a day system putting in biochar that, or biomass that produces biochar and electricity. So there's huge unmet needs there. Okay. And so you think that's like, it doesn't require sort of the centralization and factory sort of operations that can be done at a community level as well. I think the factory, the whole approach of massive biochar facilities is fundamentally wrong. Um, and, and the reason it's fundamentally wrong is that the problem is not technology. The problem is the biomass. For you know, We invented agriculture 12,000 years ago. For 12,000 years, people have been burning biomass. What do you think the hundreds of millions of farmers are going to do who are already poor and see these large factories coming in and they're not getting a, a, you know, a fair crack of the whip and, and getting the money from it? What are they going to do? They're going to continue to burn their biomass. And, and, and so unless you, so in our model, modularized systems are owned and operated by the community. They get heat, they have shared, they, they you know, let's say it's 15, $20,000. They all pile in, own it and operate it, create local jobs. They believe it belongs to them. So they're incentivized to bring in the biomass. And I think just kind of sticking a large factory somewhere, even a, you know, a $300,000 one is going to be a, a misguided approach. We have to follow the harvests. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Um, someone wanted to ask about scaling up. So the question is, uh, the removal of prosopsis seems uh, labor intensive and potentially expensive. So how does that look like when you scale it up? And is there enough funding and resources to do something like that? People say labor intensive as if it's a bad thing. You know, we're, we're, we're working with communities which have no jobs, no income, no livelihoods. So, so let's let's create jobs. We we pay them five dollars a day, which is a really good salary. Uh, we provide all the PPE equipment. We go tribe by tribe, clan by clan, making sure everybody's getting a, a fair aspect of the work. And then the community loves that. There was a thirty million dollar factory which was also using this waste biomass coming from France and Texas, I believe, and the, and it failed because the community was not buying in. So you create jobs, especially for young people, it's going to be super valuable. So so we th we see job creation as a feature, not a bug. Um, you know, you know, there's 1.3 billion people in Africa. By 2050, there'll be 2.3 billion, 1 billion of which will be youth. They need jobs. And, and, and you know, good jobs in the community building value change is great. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, and then just with the same species, Prosopis, or with anything else you're using, um, can you just talk about the carbon sort of efficiency? So when you remove the species, turn it into biochar, is it pretty much like one-to-one -one carbon removed, or do you lose carbon to the atmosphere? Um, like, yeah, how does the sort of chain look? Yeah, so so it would, obviously, it would normally be burned by the community, or it would just die and decompose. Uh, so we're we're taking it out, and, and the ratios are, are pretty good because it's a woody plant. So for, for one ton of biochar, 2.2, 2.3 2 tons of CO2 equivalent. And, and then there is a loss of CO2 and CO into the atmosphere. One of the things that we're doing now is working on the system whereby we can capture that CO with MAVA, which is one of the XPRIZE partners we have, and then put that into bricks. And so that brick is now 10% CO2. It's also 40% waste plastic. So this part of Kenya has a lot of wind turbines, which we can turn into the waste plastic. And so we need to use that, those eco concrete to create houses. So again, we're looking at ways in which we can create these the structures for people. So we're thinking of how we take waste streams and build value in the community. Again, more jobs, more creation. Got it. Okay. And then, yeah, just in terms of like that carbon efficiency with different species and different sort of heterogeneous feedstocks you're looking at, how much of that are you able to like, how much do you measure versus how much do you have to model? Um, and sort of how does that feed into the monitoring and transparency that you've talked about? So we don't model anything. So under CSI, everything, you have to audit everything. You have to take samples of every run. These are randomly uh, looked into. We bring it to the lab. We want to have a system whereby the carbon for its carbon content is being assessed in the lab, as is the soil, but then coming back mm -hmm. to the same soil over multiple years. So there's no modeling and, and, and hand waving here. It's really all about measure everything and then make sure all of that is transparently accessible. And and you know, to Toby's question about the science, it will update. I mean, this is not a this is not unusual in science. And and that's fine. We you know the data will always be available and accessible so that we can understand whether and to what extent we did it. But the main problem is, you know, why don't we have at least one million of these modular units already? Because we're so far behind it, and that's what we need to optimize. Um, and I think there's so much uh distinctions being made about what's the ideal situation where we just need to move forward rapidly. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, letting the perfect be the enemy of the good and this kind of thing, of course. Um, okay. So, yeah, I think you talked about, about how the carbon efficiency is measured. Um, someone had a kind of a similar question on the durability side. Is there modeling in that? Is that measured? And then, I guess, I mean, I know you've talked about the fact that 100 years is like the right number to be looking at for now, which, you know, we have a lot of very near term problems. But how do you kind of tie that in with what the VCM or what governments are looking for in terms of durability? Yeah, so um, I, I think this is where lots of other scientists, like like the the one who would be published on Inertonite, uh, are, are are so important. So as we see this, we'll we'll kind of understand on average what is the pool of carbon or for how long does it last. And um, we yeah. need to have a lot of research on on breakdown in the soil. But I feel all of this will 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 come to play. Uh, for some reason, people are wanting answers to these questions today, and I guess I guess it's still it for me it screams of bias. Uh, you know, we're not asking for the same thing in rock weathering. We're not asking for the same thing in ocean capture or direct air capture. You know, we just we just assume these are. I mean, direct air capture is easier, but it's it's also seven hundred dollars a pop. I mean. It's just mind blowing. So our view is to get, you know, we can produce biochar CO2 tons from biochar for about, you know, $20 a ton. Um, and, and we want to be selling a million tons a year at $25. Because yeah. that means okay. the average customer can, can, can offset his or her Starbucks coffee. And, and that drives changes in behavior. And that's what we need. We need to bring down emissions through the reinforcement that you're polluting. You should pay for that. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. So are you kind of saying that we shouldn't have an ex anti permanence rating on those, on those tons that you sell and just say, you know, we don't quite know yet, but this is like, it's at least X amount, and we should just do, go with that for now and wait for the science to catch up? Or how do you think about that? But the science is already there. So so it's like COVID, you know, we, we, we stuck a vaccine in our arm, we knew the science of that, we understood how it was developed, we knew the measurement of this, we knew there was some issues where, where in terms of efficacy or, or coverage. And then we also knew evolution comes along and we have Omicron. And, and, and so we want to, we, we, you know, we don't take the, we're not taking a clear evidence-based approach to biochar in the same way we are to so many other things in our society. And so we update prior beliefs consistently. Uh, and I think that's because maybe 95% of the people in the space are capitalists. And, and and they're just thinking of ROIs on some seed round investment. And I think we, we sort of need more public scientists in the space to teach people what is science, because most people are McKinsey type people who haven't got a clue, um, and, and then updating prior beliefs. And that's where universities and research institutes like Ithaca Institute are so vital. Okay. And like, yeah, just having done this on the ground for a while, what kind of challenges or concerns are you running into as you do it on the ground? And how do you kind of address that as you work with different farmers and different uh, different organizations? Yeah. So the challenges are, so we did this large Google project um, where we go around, they funded this prosopsis work and, and it's called uh, Warrior Review. We work with local tribes, some Morans, and we're trying to document the extent of climate change and, and making uh, changes. So we have a bunch of people running around the landscape with smartphones. And we found one girl who was seven years old, Sabina. Uh, she was to be married to a man four times her age. And, and because her family could not afford her, she was to undergo genital mutilation before being married. And 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 that's the reality on the ground. So so child marriage is up and to the right. So the reality is is starvation, poverty, and child marriage, and 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 that's what we should be solving. So we created a charity. My, uh, Kate and uh, Kate Ott and uh, myself and a lot of the community are involved. And so we're now working on improving those livelihoods. So I think it's not just perfection being the enemy of good. It's that you're not actually on the ground understanding the problem. And so because we are in 12 countries every single day, that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, and I think this becomes such a, a divorced issue from the real the real struggles. But but there's huge biomass. It is, after all, the equator. And, 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 and as a tropical scientist, it just seems like the best place to capture and store carbon at scale creating all those beneficial jobs. And now Sabina, the person we we talked about, is in school and, and she's going to, you know, spend the next 10 years of her life becoming an AI climate first uh, person. So we can 
take away the narrative from people in the global north who who are who are you know quite frankly sometimes speaking to their arses about about the problems and we just we empower people who are on the front face of climate change through ai and and better decision making to drive this forward um it just means some vcs won't win yeah it's a good segue into the last thing i wanted to ask which is and a few people have asked different versions of this but like what does scaling up look like getting to millions of carbon cubes is it you know plant village is going to scale up do you see this model being replicated by other other organizations in different parts of the world um what does that look like for different types of crops different types of models and i guess lastly maybe about the funding since maybe your view is that this doesn't fit that well into the typical capitalist vc model like how do you see that uh that side of it working as well Definitely see 10 million cubes uh, in the next um, 10 years, uh, each cube pulling down, or as a community structure, pulling down maybe 100 tons per year, um, owned and operated by local local people who are, who are getting money from it and, and shared revenue and so on. Uh, in terms of partnerships, looking at things like Biochar Life and Carboneers, who are in Malawi, Kenya, and Ghana, respectively, acting as as inroads to those communities so they start off today with something they get money today and then they build in these technology ladders um and then using it for diversity of crops so as we have new problems or new crops coming just send them off to the lab and and get them verified work with csi who are just phenomenal in this regard there's so much focus on the science and then we build up this collectively then we have too much biochar we use it for for roads and, and bricks and and all the many many uses it can be used for with co-benefits, like in the case of Carboneers, we talked to a partner there, Dabs, yesterday in Ghana, where there's ways in which we can reduce gold mine exploitation and mercury in, in the system. So uh, shared approaches through communities to build up. Uh, I do believe we can attract funds. Uh, I, I just think that the model shouldn't be 100% CDR. I, I think 80% selling farmers inputs enables them to in the average farmer in in Africa is spending about two hundred dollars a year on inputs. The average American farmer about two hundred thousand. So the gap there is huge. You can sell more, and people want better lifestyles. Uh, so provide them inputs to make them rich, and the side effect of that is carbon dioxide removal. We didn't start off in the seventeen hundreds thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great if we were four hundred twenty five parts per billion? We started off in the 1700s thinking, I'd like some electricity or a steam engine or a better life or more clothes or et cetera, et cetera. So carbon dioxide pollution was just a side effect of wanting an easier life. So go in and give people an easier life and carbon dioxide removal is a side effect of that. Great, thanks so much for being with us. This has been really interesting and really exciting to learn about what you guys are working on. Um, and Toby, back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Mega. And um, thank you to the audience for the great questions. Sorry we didn't get to them all, but um, really appreciate everyone being with us. Dr. Hughes, that was a great discussion. Um, your work's really inspiring and we're, we're big fans and we look forward to seeing what happens in the in the coming months and years with Plant Village. Grant, thank you so much for inviting me. Pleasure right. to be here. Take care. Um, just a quick word about what we have coming up next. Um, next week, we have another bikers um company graphite and so they're going to come on and talk about their uh biomass terrestrial biomass sequestration process which has a a facility uh in the ground underway in arkansas so looking forward to that thank you again for being with us everyone be well and we will see you next week